Okay, today we're going to look at some of the greatest triumphs of the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s. We'll start with the Freedom Riders. In 1960, the Supreme Court ruled that all bus stations and terminals serving interstate travelers must be integrated. The Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, decided to test the enforcement of this ruling with a specially selected interracial group of bus passengers. In May of 1961, the first bus left Washington, D.C., bound for New Orleans with 13 CORE volunteers. African American and Caucasian American Freedom Riders sat on the bus together as an integrated team to test whether the Supreme Court's ruling was being honored. They also entered the waiting rooms together as an integrated team to test whether interstate integration was in force. In Birmingham, riders, freedom riders, were greeted by a mob and were severely beaten, then driven to and dumped in Tennessee. Birmingham's Public Safety Commissioner, Bull Connor, claimed he posted no officers at the bus depot simply because of the holiday, Mother's Day. However, declassified FBI documents indicate that not only did the FBI knew of the planned attack in advance and knew that the city police were planning to stay away on purpose, they also did not purposely did not intervene to enforce federal law or to protect innocent citizens. New volunteers arrived to replace injured riders, and they continued their journey towards Montgomery, Alabama. Attorney General Robert Kennedy put pressure on the Greyhound Bus Company, and Kennedy also communicated that he was determined to enforce the Supreme Court's decision that called for integration of interstate travel. Despite assurances from Alabama officials to Robert Kennedy, there was none of the promised police protection. Again, a mob awaited them, and again, a mob greeted them with bats and pipes and beat them. Let's watch uh, this video <clears throat> that relates to these events. This probably is the most significant thing that two people who are getting uh, toward the end of their lives could do to uh, hasten the time when uh, in our own lifetime we might see America live up to its dreams. We recruited the riders for the Freedom Ride by contacting all of our core chapters around the country. We were looking for a mix of, of black, white, young, middle-aged, older. We wanted to have one member of the clergy on the trip. The Freedom Rides were trying to say to America, we are a diverse country, let's act like a diverse country where every part of the, di of the diversity is equal and is treated equally. We started out with 14 Protestant ministers, eight white and six black and four reform rabbis, and we wound up uh, with 10 of us getting arrested. We cannot submit to immoral laws which demand that we separate racially, nor can we conscientiously avoid entirely the situations in which these segregationist laws operate contrary to laws of the land. The Freedom Rides were not all just about black people. We had many whites and other nationalities and things who went along with what we were doing and they were they were doing exactly what we were doing. They were allowing themselves to be abused in this effort. Part of the disbelief that people had uh, around the country um, was the surprise in learning that, that just simple things like um, eating at a lunch counter at a bus station, if you did it interracially or if you went to the wrong waiting room, you could get beat up. When we got to Birmingham, James Peck and I, we were scheduled to uh, test the facilities. When we got in the terminal, the wall was surrounded by men and they all came towards us, and uh, they just started beating on us, and James went down almost immediately. The blood started running. I felt a hard blow, and I was on the floor of the bus, face downward. Uh, before long, uh, somebody was on top of me, and then... Uh, 
feel that we were both being kicked and pushed to the back of the bus. The Freedom Riders introduced the notion that there were whites who were as enraged as we were about uh, racism and about segregation. One major significance of the Freedom Rides was its national character. It was interracial, it was interregional, it was secular and religious. It's a, a kind of tipping point in the history of civil rights struggle. It's a sense of empowerment that an ordinary people can do extraordinary things. The result, although they never made it to New Orleans, the Freedom Riders accomplished many things. Press coverage was in support of the Riders. They forced the Kennedy administration to take a stand on civil rights as well. <clears throat> now we're going to move on to attacking segregation in southern institutions and cities. Uh, first, integrating Ole Miss, that's the University of Mississippi in 1962. James Meredith, an African-American veteran who won a court case that allowed him to attend Ole Miss, but the governor refused to allow him to register. When JFK ordered in federal troops, like Eisenhower in the Little Rock Nine, the governor got on the radio and stock, um, stoked the segregationist flames. 30 rioters, three, 30 riots broke out and it took over 5,000 soldiers to stop the rioters. Federal troops continued to escort Meredith to school and protect his family from vigilantes. Another, um, another uh, situation we're going to see is a response to uh, children marching uh, for integration causes. Oops. The Birmingham, Alabama Children's Crusade, launched by Dr. Martin Luther King and the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, also known as SCLC, brought national and global attention to the civil rights struggle in the United States. On May 2nd, 1963, black children who were trained in nonviolent tactics walked out of their classes and assembled at the 16th Street Baptist Church to march to downtown Birmingham. More than 700 children protesting racial segregation were arrested, blasted with fire hoses, clubbed by police, and attacked by police dogs. On May 3rd, 1963, hundreds more children began to march. Commissioner of Public Safety Eugene Bull Connor ordered police and firemen to attack the children with high pressure hoses batons, and police dogs. Images of the children being brutally assaulted by the police appeared on television and in newspapers across the country and world, provoking global outrage. Dr. King was also jailed during those protests and in response to criticism, wrote his famous letter from a Birmingham jail. The United States Department of Justice soon intervened. The campaign to desegregate Birmingham ended on May 10, 1963, with an agreement that SCLC would halt demonstrations in exchange for city officials releasing the jailed protesters and desegregating downtown stores. A week and a half later, the Birmingham Board of Education announced that all children who participated in the march would be suspended or expelled from school. A federal district court upheld the ruling, but a U.S. Court of Appeals reversed that decision. JFK and Civil Rights. Um, University of Alabama. JFK used federal troops to force the court ordered integration of the University of Alabama, despite resistance from Alabama Governor George Wallace. That night, he addressed the nation and demanded 
that Congress pass a new sweeping civil rights bill. This is JFK before he was assassinated. August 28, 1963. A quarter million Americans, black and white, young and old, descend on the nation's capital in a show of solidarity. It was called the March on Washington for Jobs and Freedom, but it would be remembered as a turning point in the fight for civil rights. Among the speakers, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who electrified the crowd with his stirring, I have a dream speech. So even though we face the difficulties of today and tomorrow, I still have a dream. A few months earlier, racial tensions in the Deep South had erupted. News reports carried brutal images of fire hoses blasting at the backs of school children. <laughs> President Kennedy had finally seen enough. In June of 1963, he presented sweeping civil rights legislation to Congress. Dr. King and others hoped a massive yet peaceful demonstration in Washington would spur passage of the bill. The city braced for violence, but their fears proved unfounded. The day of the march, more than 200,000 people gathered for a rally at the Washington Monument. It was the largest demonstration in the country's history. Arm in arm, they walked from the Washington Monument to the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. There, performers as diverse as Joan Baez, Bob Dylan, and Mahalia Jackson lent their voices to the cause. Martin Luther King Jr. was the last to take the stage. He began with a reference to Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation, which freed the slaves a century earlier. But 100 years later, the Negro still is not free. Partway through, King put aside his prepared text and shared with the protesters his dream of equal rights for all. Let freedom ring, and when this happens, when we allow freedom ring, when we let it ring from every village and every hamlet, from every state and every city. We will be able to speed up that day when all of God's children, black men and white men, Jews and Gentiles, Protestants and Catholics, will be able to join hands and sing in the words of the old Negro spiritual, free at last, free at last. Thanks, God Almighty, we are free at last. Um, yeah, the Civil Rights uh, Act that JFK uh, was ho hoped and that Martin Luther King supported with his march uh, did not pass until the, the after the assassination of JFK, but uh, Lyndon Baines Johnson supported, continued to support the act, and it was signed into law during uh, LBJ's uh, administration. Oops. Congress passes the most sweeping civil rights bill ever to be written into the law, and thus reaffirms the conception of equality for all men that began with Lincoln and the Civil War 100 years ago. The Negro won his freedom then. He wins his dignity now. Five hours after the House passes the measure, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 is signed at the White House by President Johnson. Before an audience of legislators and civil rights leaders who have labored long and hard for passage of the bill, President Johnson calls for all Americans to back what he calls a turning point in history. We must not approach the observance and enforcement of this law in a vengeful spirit. Its purpose is not to punish. 
Its purpose is not to divide, but to end divisions, divisions which have lasted all too long. Its purpose is national, not regional. This Civil Rights Act is a challenge to all of us to go to work in our communities and our states, in our homes and in our hearts, to eliminate the last vestiges of injustice in our beloved country. And now, so this was a, a, a federal law prohibited discrimination based on race, religion, um, uh, and, sorry, my thing isn't working. Basically, all public uh, accommodations were required by federal law uh, not to discriminate based on race, religion, etc. That was the crux of this Voting Rights Act. Uh, but the fight isn't over in 1964. There's still the issue of voting rights, and this is the most powerful thing because this is the thing that will put people in government, put people in the presidency, put people in Congress that, that recognize the rights and the needs of all Americans, if all Americans get the right to vote. So some of the obstacles to African American voting uh, Ninety percent of African Americans were not able to vote at that time. Uh, grandfather cl clauses kept African Americans from voting because their gr grandfathers couldn't. Uh, there was also poll taxes, charge a tax to keep poor uh, blacks from voting, and this was, even though this was outlawed. Um, literacy te uh, tests kept African Americans from voting due to their lack of education. Um, and so what, what takes place in response to this issue that still needs to be resolved is referred to as the Freedom Summer. Civil rights activists began registering African American voters in an effort to elect those who would support civil rights legislation. Efforts were concentrated in, in Mississippi, which was referred to as the Closed Society. Volunteers were beaten and killed by the KKK with the support of local police, and churches and businesses were bombed that supported the movement. I was standing up there and the people started running. I was standing up there and the people started running. I just don't see how anybody can say that a man can fight in Vietnam, but he can't vote uh, in uh, the post office.
following public disgust over the images and over the death uh, incurred in the earlier Selma marches, LBJ called for a Voting Rights Act. King and his supporters again marched on Montgomery, this time with federal protection, and some 25,000 flooded the city as they walked into Montgomery. Um, and so then the Voting Rights Act of 1965 was passed. It eliminated literacy tests as a requirement for voting, also allowed federal officials to register those state those that state officials denied. Uh, tripled the percentage, th this act tripled the percentage of African-American voters in the South. That is all.